Um, good evening and uh, welcome to the January 10th, 2006 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. And if we could start with uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, that'd be great. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have some adjustments to the agenda. Alan? Yes, I have a couple of adjustments. First of all, under number one, uh, the Cape Elizabeth High School choral performance got left on there from December, so just cross that off. Uh, secondly, under communication, uh, you have 6A, which is 7th and 8th grade career exploration fair. I'm also going to add to that a uh, letter concerning substitutes, which uh, I will go over tonight. I just received that yesterday. Also, we have a presentation tonight by the Cape Elizabeth High School Science, members of the Cape Elizabeth High School Science Department, which got left off, and that will be after 8C on here will be their presentation. Uh, under 9A, would you change Kathy Ray's name to Rebecca Millett? And on the back of the sheet, would you change the personnel committee meeting? Uh, just got changed today. It is now Thursday, January 26, 2006, 1 o'clock in my office. I would also add that the uh extracurricular activities committee meeting. There was an error in the minutes. And that meeting is scheduled for Thursday, January 19th at 2 o'clock in the William H. Jordan Conference Room. 19th. Great, thank you. I have one more. Okay. Elaine. Under uh, new business E, um, I would like to add consideration of the extracurricular activity committee goal and charge. Okay. Got that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we need a approval of the December school board minutes. They were attached in your packet. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second? Trish? Discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the comments by our middle school representatives. Uh, we have Jack Fisher and Will Daly. Oh, all of us should be talking about the fifth grade this year. Ah, uh, fifth and sixth graders this time. Um, un unfortunately, a final total on the vandalisms in the school is just under $8,000. But fortunately, almost all of it has been recovered by the police. Oh, sorry. I'm um, seventh and eighth graders. Um, February 3rd is the next dance. Um, tomorrow's a half day. No school for Martin Luther King Jr. Day next Monday. Um, Mrs. Lala Rohner, our new art teacher, has received a $1,000 grant for, from CEF for uh, Kiev mur murals in the 7th grade wing. Um, she'll be working with students on how to create those, and they'll be choosing pictures from this year's Kiev to, um, to base the murals on. Um, girls basketball <laughs> tryouts started yesterday. And they continued into today and I th think throughout the week. Yeah, uh, yesterday the first Nordic ski team race was held in Pineland. And um, the Cape girls finished first and the Cape boys finished third. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, on the half day tomorrow, the fifth and sixth grade are having their first social, actually at the Falmouth Ice Arena and our first social uh, was canceled because we only had about 70 kids who signed up for it out of like 150 and we needed about 80 and the second one was canceled because of the snow day. Um, this we actually sold out completely 150 kids which is great because we worked harder on kind of sponsoring it basically. Um, 
it'll be from 11 to 1:15, I believe. Um, kids can bring, you know, there'll be there'll be food served there. Um, the fifth grade student council representatives were um, elected, and they are Alex Bornick and Alex Cooley. And the um, for Christmas, the um, middle school sponsored a Sudanese refugee family, uh, seven children and one mother. And some of the uh, supplies that we got them were uh, not supplies, but uh, we got them some winter clothes, some winter jackets. Um, presents like CD players, remote control, trucks, uh, and a family actually donated a uh, Christmas tree with um, ornaments and everything on it. Um, background of the family is in the Sudan, they lived in a 10 by 10 house, eight people in a 10 by 10 house, um, 10 feet by 10 feet. Um, they had to wait in a two hour line for water every morning from one well. Let's see, a food truck came for each family once a month, and there was no sanitation. So that's kind of a big step up for that family, and we hope we made it. Great. Oh, thank you, all students, for, for donating and helping out that family. It sounds like a worthy cause. Do we have any other questions for the boys? I'm just curious, what hallway is the mural going in? You know? Okay, great. That's going to be fun to watch. Well, thank you. Um, we'll move on to the high school students. Uh, looks like we have Daly here. Thank you. Okay, well, I don't know where Connor is. I'm guessing he must have thought it was 7.30. I don't know why. But, uh, okay. and, uh, not too much is going on. Pretty soon we're going to have 15 Costa Rican exchange students come. So that'll be cool. It'll be some more diversity and some different culture to look at. And there's going to be an SAC election for a new president because there's a, there's a new election halfway in between the terms for presidents. And the library has been being renovated, and it hasn't really affected us too much, but it's kind of the news. <laughs> That's about it. Anyone have any questions uh, for Daly? Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, at, this, at this point, um, we uh, open up our meeting for comments from the public on non-agenda items, if anyone would like to take advantage of that opportunity. Seeing none, um, we'll move on to communications. I have a couple of communications this evening. First of all, I'd like to comment each month on the enrollment look that you get in your packet to look at it and, real, and know that right now in January we have 1,840 students in the Cape School system. Uh, it is two more than last uh, month at this time, and last year at this time we had 1821, so we are 19 more than we were last year at this time. Uh, I have a uh, communique from the middle school about the 9th Annual 7th and 8th Grade Career Exploration Fair, which is scheduled for Wednesday, January 25th, uh, and a snow day of Wednesday, February 1st, even though we won't need it. Uh, it's at the Cape Middle School from 7.30 to 9.30 a.m., and I don't know if you want Steve to just speak to that briefly about what's what will be happening there. Sure, that'd be great. Thank you, Steve. Good evening. Okay, uh, Gail Schmader, the systems volunteer coordinator, and Rick Madden have worked uh, for a number of years. There used to be a career fair that happened in Portland, and a number of schools could send to that, but that was discontinued. So Rick's idea was let's, let's continue the work that we're doing for our kids here and uh, because it was such great opportunities to see different kinds of careers. And so in working with Gail, Gail uh, uh, Rick comes up with the ideas and Gail puts the, the rubber to the road and finds people of every walk of life to come in and present to our students. 
So we have probably, I'm going to just say off the top of my head, it might be like 30 presenters who are going to be doing uh, careers, everything from dealing with animals to, uh, to winter, uh, winter kinds of careers to technology, veterinary, you, you name it. There, there is a wealth of opportunities. And the kids will go to, the, they're in the process right now of signing up for which presentations they would like to see and they have their first, second, third choices and they'll see a couple of presentations during the fair and they have the opportunity um, to, after the presenters present, of course, to uh, ask questions of the, of the presenters. And it's really, the idea is that uh, there's a lot of things that the kids don't know that's out there right now. I remember being the same age and thinking, let's see, my, aunt, my mother's a teacher, my father's a principal, five aunts, three uncles. Of course, everybody teaches, so <laughs> I kind of think I stuck with that one. But uh, later on, I realized, oh, yeah, this kid's father owns the store down the street. My God, people do other things. So uh, it's an opportunity to give the kids a look at what kinds of fields are out there. And the, the reports, Rick has shared with me last year's reports from students, rave reviews from this, um, I think like 100%. So this is a, a, a big deal that the kids really enjoy. Great. Thank you. Okay. And I also have added to this a letter which I received yesterday, which I believe each of you received also, from Ann Cranshaw, who is a substitute in our system. The letter uh, I will summarize is basically talking about concerns about the fact that the uh, compensation for substitutes has really not been reviewed in the last five years, uh, talking about the fact that many of our subs commit themselves only to substituting Cape Elizabeth, which I will tell you, having been in other districts, is very helpful when they're not trying to spread themselves between other districts in the area. Uh, she has uh, mentions in here also that has there is some feeling about uh, whether they have been uh, truly recognized as a part of the system and comments on the fact that <coughs> ID badges, uh, that they were not given ID badges at that point in time, et cetera, and is, and is asking that we reconsider the compensation. What I'm going to suggest to the board is that this go to the personnel committee to review from there and make some decisions accordingly. Okay. Anything else? That's everything that I have. Okay. I would just like to take a moment um, to um, let the public know and also to thank the town council for hosting the school board at last Thursday's workshop at the fire station. Um, it is something that we've done over the past several years. We start off the month of January before we head into budget season. Getting together them in a little bit more of a relaxed situation, um, we hear a presentation from the town council and Mike McGovern on the municipal side of the budget and just a general outlook of some of the challenges that they'll be facing. And of course, we in turn take that opportunity to plead our case on some of the legislation that's coming out of uh, Augusta, some of the particular challenges that we have, not only in our, our capital improvement budget, but also in meeting some of the Main State learning results and No Child Left Behind, some of our programming and building needs. So um, it was very productive talk. Um, it does, I left there with, it is a dire picture, but um, it is a sign that, a good sign that we're meeting together and it really is my hope that we'll continue to meet um, um, during the budget season uh, together. So um, I just wanted to share that and thank the town council. And I'd also like to note that we also had a school board workshop last week and Ann Belden has facilitated the workshop along with Alan Hawkins. It was a great workshop and I'd just like to ask Ann to take a few moments to um, let everyone know what we did and what the follow-up is going to be and the opportunity for the public and the students to participate in the future. Um, well, it was a, I think it was a first step of what really might be a really exciting um, process as we move along. Um, we were lucky enough to have Stephen Spring come and facilitate the evening. He works with the Mitchell Institute um, in Portland, which um, uh, funds the uh, a project called the Great Maine Schools Project. And we asked Stephen to come and help facilitate a discussion that Alan and I had been talking about how we might have um, here in our school community around things like student voice, youth empowerment, school, climate, and culture, and how all of those things kind of fit together 
to, um, you know, to, to create the great school system that we have here. And we talked about things like our, <clears throat> what kinds of opportunities do we offer our students to voice their opinions? Are we hearing from all of the different students in our school community? Are we only hearing from you know, certain types or sections of students? How can we encourage more of that? What leadership opportunities do we offer in our schools? Um, what are the sort of the subcultures that exist in our school community and how do those sort of all combine to create our overall culture? And, and how can we really explore that farther? And what we came up with that day, that night, was um, we all in small groups brainstormed questions that we might like to ask to different focus groups of kids. And so we actually generated 50 questions that are going to, of course, have to be way whittled down. Um, and we plan to organize, uh, over the next month or two, um, focus groups in each of the three schools. One of the really exciting things that came out of it was we were originally just kind of focusing on high school, really only because that's what the Great Maine Schools Project does, is they, they look at high schools. But what came out of that evening was that people felt that we wanted to we want to look at this for our entire district K through 12, which is really exciting. There are a lot of things that are going on um, in other school districts and in other states that we want to take a look at, and just to you know to see what more we can do. One of the things we learned from Stephen Spring is that our school is actually way ahead of the game compared to a lot of other high schools. Um, in the state, and, and that's always great to hear, but that doesn't mean that we can't explore this further and really do a little bit more, more work around this. So I, I'm excited. I think all of us are committed to, to looking at this further and seeing what we can, what we can do down the road. Great. Thank you. I'd like to move on to recognition. With your permission, I'd like to ask if we might do the science thing from Elizabeth High School next. I think Susan would appreciate that, number one. If that would be all right to put that on next. That'd be, sure. Okay. That'd be so, fine. Great. So um, I have here this evening Doug Worthley, uh, Mike Efron. I also, Carrie Curtis is here, and Sue Garat, who are all members of the science department. They had contacted me several months ago about coming to speak. And uh, I met with Michael uh, just before the holidays, I believe. We talked about what the focus might be. and I. Doug has already told me that's the focus for tonight. So that's Doug, right. To um, and I am Doug Worthley in the Science Department. Sue Garrett, Carrie Curtis, and Dr. Efron here. Um, and want to thank you folks for your time and listening to us tonight. And time is the issue that, we want, that we're here to present. I know that we uh, read about how science, is, uh, science students in the U.S. are falling behind the rest of the world. Um, and this wasn't so in the 50s and 60s when the focus was on Sputnik and the space race and, and that. Um, and science was given more time in, in schools. Since the 70s, there's been a gradual repeal of the proportion, proportional time that sciences have in U.S. classrooms. Eight years ago, uh, in Cape Elizabeth, we lost, the science department lost 22% of our time uh, when the school went to a different schedule. Uh, gave, uh, it was a revolving block, it is now, it's a revolving block schedule. And um, that's more than a fifth of class time, meeting with kids. Um, also during the past six years, we've become aware of advances in science teaching, uh, science teaching methods, and these methods require more time. But most science teachers across the state and nation are aware and understand that time, uh, more time is crucial for science learning. So how do we stack up against our nearest neighbors uh, in the neighboring schools, our peers? And I have this, I'm sorry. This, um, this is a minute per day for the Move over and just uh, move this out to how many minutes a year that adds up to. You can see that the numbers are quite different. I mean, they have a lot more time to do this. So to illustrate that a little bit better, even. Is 
What if our what if our kids going to school forty one point eight seven minutes a day had to make up that time to catch up with the other schools? How many more days would they have to go to catch up? How many more days kids students would have to go to school to equal these school science contact time? That's how many more days they would have to go. We'd have to go to match from Holly and Shevis, 42 days, 35 days, to match Thomas, contact time with students. It's days a year? Days per year, yeah. And the blue line in there, so if we said, okay, we're going to add it on to the end of the school year, the blue line is summer vacation. So we could never catch up to bring these contact time with students and ever catch up to Star Wars. So we're, we're in a hole, so to speak. And to illustrate that a little bit better, um, and some personal ideas, Sue Garrett would like to speak for a couple minutes. Thanks. Uh, this is my second year at Cape, uh, and I teach uh, college prep biology and AP biology. And previously I was teaching at Saugus in Massachusetts, and I was there for, I think, at least seven years. And in that time, I think three years in, they switched over to block scheduling. And what I was teaching each unit was about four labs, three, four labs. And then what happened is we went to block scheduling and we found that we didn't have as much time. Uh, there was less lab time. And so I had to cut down to about two labs per unit in order to meet the, uh, the curriculum ob objectives for, you know, for the state. Um, what's amazing is that I moved here last year and with this block scheduling, which is really a modified block scheduling, which is something I've never seen before, uh, it, it's actually less time than Saugus, and I find that I have maybe one lab per unit. So I went from four, like seven years ago, to one, which is really uh, quite shocking. Uh, one thing that is kind of surprising, too, is that Cape um, Elizabeth is such an excellent school, and you know, I will just say that Saugus is not a top school in Massachusetts. Um, so I was really surprised by that difference. And basically what it comes down to is that, especially with the college prep kids, they really need to hear it and do it and see it and you know, maybe see a clip of a video. And we're, we don't have time to do all the different modalities and so they're, they're really losing out in, in deep understanding. Um, and, you know, honors kids, you could probably give them a book and they'll learn it. But definitely with college prep, they really need these different ways. And I, sometimes I'm just picking one, but it's not necessarily the best one. And it's usually better to do several activities and we just don't, I just can't. So that's just based on my experience in the past several years. Dr. Efron is going to talk to us now with some data. Thank you, Sue. I'm here to describe a change in pedagogy, in instructional style that we're undertaking. This instructional style is called modeling in physics, and it leads to much greater student learning. Uh, I could call this discovery learning. It has similarities to discovery learning, but it's far more structured. I could call it hands-on instruction, for it is hands-on. But it's hands-on with a deep understanding of the kind of alternate conceptions of the world that students bring with them when they enter a physics course. Modeling is research-based. It has developed the hands-on labs that allow students to investigate new understandings. It allows them to test their original understandings against what the world is doing. It modeling allows students to be scientists. The data shows the power of good instruction. Okay, so I need to, uh, I hope you got a copy of the report I wrote. Did you? No, it was not in our packet. Uh, okay. Um, well, let me give you some background on this. Um, 
The fourth, uh, the concept inventory is a national test that comes out of a, a movement in this country called physics education research. And it has been the standard for measuring uh, students' incorporation of the, of the concepts in uh, mechanics, which is what any physics course starts with. Okay? Uh, I would say in the last 20 or so years, there's probably tens of thousands of uh, students that have taken the concept inventory. Most of the data is collected at the college level. Uh, at the high school level, it's mostly seniors. And what I'm showing you is data from our ninth graders starting, compiled over the last three years since we started doing physics first. So one of the powers of this, and it now it comes with a pre and a post test. I, I didn't put the pre test on because I'm trying to make this as simple to present as possible. Um, the power of, of doing this is it's, it's, I, we have national norms that we could compare against. Um, you could see that there's three different kinds of uh, groupings here. There, uh, in the first column, we have the honors ninth graders who were instructed with modeling. In the second column, this is compiled over the last three years. If you look at the little box there, it tells you the number of students in each group. So over the last three years, that's 127 students who were in honors ninth grade and were instructed with modeling instruction. In the second group, honors ninth graders who were instructed with conventional instruction, 50 students. And the college prep ninth graders, 137 over the last three years. And we've only used the conventional, maybe I should call it traditional instruction with our college prep students. So, so let me just tell you, say a word about what the conventional instruction is. It's, may or may not be the way you were taught physics if you ever took physics back in high school. It's textbook based. Uh, you, you, you read the textbook, the assignments come from the textbooks. The labs you do happen somewhere in the chapter and they verify the fact that the textbook got it right. <laughs> um, and that's what I'm calling the kind of conventional way that, that uh, science is usually taught, physics is usually taught. Okay, um, so there are our results and you can see that the, uh, the easiest comparison is to look at the honors students because they were taught, same groupings of kids taught two different instructional ways. And in terms of the post-test score, the honors kids are at 70% and the uh, conventionally taught honor students are, looks like, around 48%. And the conventionally taught college prep students post scores of around, it looks like, 42, 43%. Now, when this is reported in the national literature, usually what's reported is gain scores. So I'll talk about the gain scores, because that's the easiest comparisons to the national database. The gain scores show how much the students have gained from their pretest to the post-test. Okay, so that's what the gain score means. The honors ninth graders with modeling with a gain score of 60%, that matches, that matches in the national database the same kind of gain scores that high school seniors get when they're taught with modeling. And it matches the same kind of gain scores that college students get when they're taught with modeling. Our ninth graders are doing the same as college students taught this way. And gain scores for traditionally taught students usually range between 25 and 30 percent, and that's exactly what our traditionally taught ninth graders are doing. So on the one hand, you would think that this is good news. Uh, our ninth graders are doing much the same as seniors and college students. I'm here to tell you that it's really not good news. The 
consistent analysis that's usually not pursued in the national database. When you average it, you get these, these gain scores that I just showed you on the previous chart. But this looks more closely at what individual students are doing. And let me say a word about what entry means, because it could easily be a confusing idea. You could see that this is matching the percent versus at or above entry, and you can see the scores kind of are similar to the gain scores. But what entry means is, have the students incorporated these new ideas that they've learned in mechanics, have they really incorporated it into their thinking? If they've gotten to the entry level, which represents a certain score on this concept inventory, if they got to the entry level, it means they've begun incorporating these ideas into their thinking, into their understanding of the way the world around them works. If they don't get to the entry level, then it's a pretty good indication that they haven't really begun integrating these ideas into, into their thinking. And if it hasn't begun integrating into, the, into their thinking, then chances are, a year later, they will not have retained very much. And if they have begun really incorporating this into the way they think about things, then a year later, their scores will not go down. Okay? Because it's become part of the way they think. So this, I think, is a really important indicator of how the students are doing. And here you see the differences become dramatic. 72% of the ninth graders taught with modeling have gotten uh, to the entry level or above, compared to about 18% of the honors ninth graders taught conventionally, and about 8% of the college prep kids taught conventionally. And from my point of view, being these kids' teachers, that's not good enough. We're trying to educate all the students. All the stuff says all the students. This is not all the students. So, the message I want to leave you with is that this type of instruction, when we allow students to actually play the role of scientists, test their ideas that they have in their heads against what the world is doing is time intensive. It's classroom time intens intensive. This isn't something we can assign for homework. The only way to do this kind of instruction is to have classroom time, and we don't have enough. Thank you. And just to conclude some bullets there for you. Um, we need more time for the following reasons. We had 22% of our class time taken away eight years ago. Uh, we have less contact time with students than most of our peer schools. Uh, skipping down one, the science teaching methods that Dr. Efron related to dictate the need for more in-class time. And we can uh, reach from there and say that, you know, we, we just can't meet the state and national standards with the present time structure that we have. Uh, we need to expand, if we want to cover more the, the state and national standards, we need to expand our breadth and depth of science, science content coverage. Okay, thank you very much. I just, I, I would like to thank the three of you who presented this evening. Uh, I've talked, I think Michael, Although I've known Michael for quite a few years, I think he was the first staff member that I talked with when I first got here last summer. Uh, and it's because of his passion about this. And Doug uh, has been the same. We've talked many times in the halls at uh, Cape Elizabeth High School. And uh, uh, I have no argument with him whatsoever that we need to find more time. Jeff and I have talked about this. Jeff originally came to me about it. Uh, we are very clear that it's needed. We're very clear it has financial implications. Uh, and so I invited them to speak to it. Uh, Mike, as I said, Michael and I talked just before the holidays. Uh, I invited them to come and speak to it from the perspective of we've got to be looking at this. Where it will go, and I think I was clear on that, I'm not sure it will go very far this year, but it certainly needs to be something that the board is very much aware of as, uh, as we move ahead. 
Uh, I think uh, the charts that they showed tonight uh, speak very clearly to the fact that we're not coming anywhere near meeting the time needs of the science department in order to ensure an uh, extremely strong science program. And the only other thing I'll speak to very quickly is I had never heard of Physics First until I came to Cape. And uh, I, I'm from that old school who had physics as seniors and uh, struggled. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> and uh, you know what I'm hearing uh, from Michael uh, as far as this physics program and what is happening and what he just showed us there is that it is a program that not only affects the learning process in physics, but affects the learning process throughout as students begin to look at uh, learning and I recognize metacognition and how you learn. And so I think it's a very important point that we need to keep in mind because we do have a very valuable program here in Cape and we want to strengthen it, not let it get any weaker. Thank you. When might may we have time to discuss this? When, uh, I think part of this uh, will come in budget at the time, and uh, as, we, as we go through that process. Uh, certainly part of it is going to come, I'm looking at a couple of you, uh, as we go through the curriculum process too, and, and looking at what, uh, what the uh, issues are. Uh, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, because we know uh, the cost of it, it is not in the specific budget this year, but I also know in my discussions with Jeff it is something we could put together to give you a picture of uh, what it might cost and even if we did it incrementally because it is going to require increasing staff in order to make this happen. Am I correct on that, Jeff? That's right. Rebecca? Um, yeah, I just have a couple of clarifying questions just so that I can walk away from this presentation fully understanding. Um, when we, maybe I'm incorrect in my understanding here, but the, it seems that we have two issues. One is a, it's a time issue. Um, and we compare ourselves with the time with Falmouth and et cetera. Do they have longer school days? I would have to No, I, I, I don't believe, I think we have one of the longest school days. But, but they, what they have, um, that most of them have, is they have their science classes have the basic core of their time, the same as English and history and foreign language, and they also have additional lab periods, Rebecca. Uh -huh. And that lab time disappeared because of scheduling reasons or financial reasons? Uh, I wasn't here at that time, and to be honest with you, I've heard different things. I think a part of it was, I think it was a, probably a little bit of both. Is you would answer here? that way. <laughs> I think it was largely scheduling. Thank you, Michael. That's my, my recollection as well. That it, there was no financial uh, consideration when those decisions were made. So I, I would, and that's my sense of, of what the what was presented to us tonight. That that perhaps there is, I I understand that perhaps you want to bring a new curriculum in to, uh, around physics, um, and that would indeed be a financial issue. Um, but around the time issue, I would ask the board if, um, or actually you, Alan, is whether. You know, it's the scheduling that needs to be looked at to make time available for the labs. I'll stand up to, to sort of make this point. The scheduling issue really does, um, is the staffing issue. Because if, typically what happens in most high schools is science, all, all teachers in Cape Elizabeth High School teach five classes. Um, typically in most high schools, when there is additional lab time that's in addition to the root time that an English teacher has or a foreign language time, uh, that additional lab time is treated as the science teacher's fifth class uh, because otherwise the science teachers would be, te particularly with the labs and the complexity of setting them up and putting them down and all that sort of thing. So you can't solve um, the time issue without adding staff um, unless we were to drive our science teachers um, out of the school system. And that's the last thing that I want to do because we have an outstanding science department. But that's, if you look at high schools that have additional lab time, the science teachers teach four classes, 
plus they have that additional time because it essentially they're doubling up um, with, with particular classes. In fact, in many of the classes, those teachers still teach more time than um, English teachers or social studies teachers or other teachers uh, because they want to be able to maximize the time that they spend in labs. But I, I, I understand that if we were tried to add back the lab time, that would there, therefore increase the costs that we would incur for science. But at the same time, I'm trying to understand why originally that lab time was taken away when there weren't the same budgetary constraints, perhaps, that we're facing today. I, I, but again, I wasn't here, um, and I will defer to Michael's understanding of what the primary motivation was, that it was, it sounds as if what it was, was it, it becomes more complex from a scheduling standpoint to fit things into the schedule because what happens basically is, for example, we have an eight period schedule at the high school. Um, all classes right now meet one period. If we were to add additional lab periods, what would happen is all of those science classes would meet one period and plus they would also meet some days for a second period as well. Um, and then it becomes, the complexity becomes, how do you get the, the other classes to sort of intersect with that? Does that make sense? Is that? Sort of. I, I guess maybe what I would ask, because I don't want to drag this on, is that at some point if we could get maybe even just um, an explanation paper maybe as to why we in Cape Elizabeth are struggling with this issue and it seems other districts are not, I, I think that that comparison probably needs to be made. Because I think what would also be helpful, Rebecca, in this, and I think I'm right, is over the last few years, there have been many more courses added to high schools across the state uh, with main learning results and also just because of the changes that are going on. But yet, the, day, the school day has not increased. Uh, so you are, you are adding more and more things into a very finite amount of time. And so I think you're right. I think we, we need to take a look at that and, and in the long run determine uh, what is it that we is essential and what is it we most with, right. with I mean if, if, if um, all these other districts are able to offer that substantial amount more of science time what is it that we have that they don't have if, if, if this is a trade-off and I think it's a good question and it's something we can pull together yep. okay I, Anne, go ahead. Yeah. I was just trying to also understand I mean you focused on the, the ninth grade physics but I'm assuming that this sort of goes for 9 through 12, all the science, the, right. the issue remains f f for all of the four. Yeah, modeling lends itself uh, uh, primarily to physics, but there are aspects of modeling, the, the pedagogy of modeling, that we could incorporate into chemistry and biology. Um, again, it's, the, it's a time issue, and without that time, we can't really consider doing that unless we drop any sort of coverage. And so then I'm just trying to understand how the students, those lucky students that got the modeling, mm -hmm. you know, how were we able to, you just kind of juggled time for a certain amount of the ninth grade physics students so that they could have the modeling? I believe that there was less coverage in content. Okay, so I So that see. they did, okay. instead of getting, uh, instead of getting through yeah. Um, certain concepts, they focused and went in more depth in, uh, in, in mechanics. And so then those, ch those chart graphs then, were they referring to like, it, you know, the understanding in specific content areas? I was to, sort of taking that as an overall year of physics, like gain, the gain. It's the gain of mechanics. The net gain. Mm -hmm. but, but overall content areas? No. It's not over yeah. the, all the okay. content area. But still, even if they were focusing on, they did it when they finished mechanics versus, you know, it started mechanics, and then when they finished mechanics, they took the post-test, and then the data was calculated from that. Regardless of the time involved, there still was a gain of that much um, using modeling as a, as a technique. I see. Okay. okay. Thanks. Mike, piggyback Thanks. on that, please. Michael, I wanted to first clarify on your, your data that you presented. When you showed us, um, you know, honors modeling, honors conventional, and then CP conventional, we were talking about Cape Elizabeth students? Yes. Okay. And I understand now that in order for the modeling to go into place, um, there was less content area covered. But it still seems like the students 
who had um, the modeling program um, enjoyed significantly more success in physics than the other two groups of students. Is that correct? I mean, the st that, I, I, that's what I thought the statistics were showing us, regardless of whether it was the content you would I'm, like I'm, to I'm teach thinking, I'm or thinking the content about, actually covered. I'm thinking about your word enjoyed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they, I think, yes, they did enjoy more success, but it came at a cost. We covered less material. And we have the uh, main learning results, the state telling us that we got to cover all of this material. We, we are not. Um, we have also, I, I should say, in, in, in our own belief systems, we should be covering more material. And, and, and we're not. I understand that entirely. That and um, I'd like to f cover. No, the data was all Cape Elizabeth students. Okay. All data here. Are we going to, in, regardless of time available, are we going to drive the modeling down to the college prep students? I. That's what we're doing this year. Okay. The, um, the when main learning results gave us a year off. Uh, we looked at that data, all of us together, and we said we got to do modeling with the college prep students. And we're doing that this year. And I think we're doing, I think we and the students are doing fine. Okay, I, mean, so, I, mean, so I don't know what the data will come out, but, but uh, I'm hopeful. <laughs> all right, so if I'm understanding you correctly, modeling works, you're driving it down to everyone in, you know, ninth graders. Yes. Across all learning styles and learning levels, I guess. Um, and so the real issue for us is to find you time to increase the content to where you would like it to be. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And from what I understand now, we'll see some of this at budget time uh, in the high school budget uh, or proposal um, to address some of this. And we'll also hear from Alan in, on some form of written um, comparison and uh, probably some supporting data to justify what we're looking yep. at. Um, what I've done right now is you won't, in the, in the core documents that I have that Pauline and, and Alan have seen to this point, I don't have this proposal in. Um, I have put it in as the top priority for one year out, but I can certainly prepare with the science teachers um, an analysis of what it would cost. Mm -hmm. um, to do it as early as possible. Um, the scheduling issues, and I've, I've talked to the science teachers about it, the scheduling issues that contributed heavily to, to um, dropping that additional time, I'm convinced can be solved. Um, it, it's really at this point, regardless of how we got to here, it's really an issue of staffing um, and, and a budget issue for us. Okay, it's not to say that creating the additional time uh, would, would win the 100% glowing endorsement of every single teacher in the high school, but I'm convinced that it can be done without, without sacrificing um, uh, anything substantial. Okay. I think that'd be a great idea to see some of that as soon as possible, um, if, if just to help us in our long-term planning, strategic planning. and. Um, I, I suspect the appreciate. science teachers will set up a meeting with me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's right. I'm already meeting with them, so I think the agenda has just been set. Well, good. I'm sure it sounds like, oh, we get more questions here, Rebecca. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, actually, I, and I think um, I've, I've said this to Alan, and um, I'd like to share this with the administrators. My, my perspective as a school board member is that I, I would appreciate knowing from you what you think is necessary today to do the job that we need to do for our students. Um, with or without spending caps. We will then take that information and try to come up with the best decision, but then we can then show our constituents what it is that we cannot cover from your perspective of what needs to be done because of our constraints. So please, don't hold back. I mean, obviously, we're not encouraging you for pie in the sky kind of idea. Um, making, but for me, 
I shouldn't say we, I should say for me, I, I'm not encouraging that, but I would really appreciate knowing what you think is essential, whether or not, what, with or without the funds that, that you know is there. Evan. Um, I guess I'll change in uh, my comment and first say that I do support Rebecca's uh, request. The other thing is that uh, Dr. Efron mentioned at the beginning of his report that he had authored a report, which is apparently not in our school board packets, and I would certainly like to get that report. Anything else? Okay. Thank you again for taking the time to come out and share this information. Appreciate it. We will move back up to item seven, which is recognition. And Alan, if you could speak to those. I have three recognitions this evening. Uh, first of all is from the art department at Cape Elizabeth High School. Uh, <coughs> just to speak to this briefly, this is about the annual Scholastic Art Awards. And the reason I am pleased to do this is I've been involved with this in the past. And to see the size of the high school we have and the number of students who have been honored this way is really important. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to Lincoln Center in uh, New York City last year and see one of my students in my former district's art there, and it looks like we could possibly have a Cape Elizabeth student there this year, we hope. So what I will, the first one is out of nine entries in the annual Scholastic Arts Award at Cape Elizabeth High School and the competition at Maine College of Arts, seven Cape students won regional recognition. Now that's seven out of nine. Uh, Whitney Legg, Allison Meehan, Tina Shaw, and Chelsea Stephenson uh, were awarded gold medal recognition. Max Bartlett, Elise Both Bothell, and Calvin Klopp were awarded silver. Gold medal recipients will have their work sent to New York to be judged nationally. The exhibit will be open to the public from January 6th until the 22nd at the Maine College of Arts Contemporary Art Gallery space. I would highly recommend any of you who can get there to go. Uh, I went last year, I planned to go this year, and it's amazing what you see there for art. So it is congratulations to the visual arts students at Cape High School. Then at the bottom of this, I also have congratulations to Cape Elizabeth Middle School art students. Three uh, middle school students have been selected as silver key recipients in the regional program of Scholastic Arts Awards and Maine Cong Congressional District Art Awards for 2006. Nell Britton, Jay Cushing, and Holly McIntyre will have their work displayed at the Maine College of Arts from January 6th to the 21st in their contemporary art gallery space. So again, uh, very proud of the art programs at both schools and what, what they have been able to accomplish. Uh, the second one that I have is about Janet Hoskin, who is the Assistant Director of Community Services. Uh, she was recently inducted into the Maine Field Hockey Hall of Fame. She is the first player to be inducted. Up until this year, recipients have been coaches and officials. Janet's college playing career was at the University of Maine from 1978 to 1981, and she still holds the record uh, records in career goals of 47 and career points of 104. So congratulations to Janet also for this. And that's what I have to Great. Thank you and congratulations to the students. And um, I'd also just like to say um, uh, uh, congratulations to the teachers also who had those students. Um, they, um, I'm sure... <coughs> from the elementary school all the way through the high school contributed greatly to the level of performance of those students. So, thank you. Um, the superintendent's report. Uh, very quickly, uh, the first two anyway. Uh, school board policies, uh, we've spoken for a while that they're gonna be on the website. They are now there. Uh, the actual web address has not come up yet. That will be coming up very soon. But all of you have received an email which lets you get into it. Uh, it has, uh, Anne, had uh, communications yesterday, the day before with Wendy. And so what Wendy has done is index it, both by sections A, B, C, D, E, et cetera, and then also by the, by the policies. The policies that are up right now, uh, correct me Ann, if I'm wrong, are the 2004-2005 revisions that you and your committee have done uh, as you've gone through the process. And so eventually all policies will be on there. And if you haven't had a chance to look at it, please do. It is very attractive. and very well done and very quick to use. I don't know, Ann, if you wanted to comment on it also or not. But. 
No, I just want to thank Wendy. I'm sure she took a lot of time, and it's very easy. It's it's easy to follow. It's um, I think it'll be really helpful to people. And I do just want to say, if there are a lot of policies, obviously not on there that we haven't gotten to reviewing yet, and all people need to do is to contact the superintendent's office to get a copy of those if they don't see what they're looking for. Uh, the second one that I have is just school board budget workshops as a reminder. Uh, this list has gone out in many different ways, but I just want to do a reminder again. The first uh, budget workshop, we did have the town council school board workshop on the 5th. On the 24th of January, which is a Tuesday at 7 p.m., we'll be doing the first uh, budget workshop uh, looking at the superintendent's budget, and that will be at the high school library. Uh, I will mention that that does not mean that the entire budget will be ready at that point. We are still in the process of meeting with each of the cost center managers. Uh, we'll finish that up this week. Uh, we will then begin to put the uh, budget document together. Uh, I will, as uh, Rebecca mentioned a few minutes ago, I have stressed with all the cost center managers that I want everything that they think is necessary in order to maintain appropriate programs at all of our schools. And some of those will be on a list that you will look at as, as additions. Some will be on there as recommendations from me. And so that we will be taking a look at it from the perspective of what that means when we look at what we see as the cap on the budget at this point in time. Uh, several people have also asked me. Uh, I will uh, found out today that the information from the state on our subsidy will probably not be here until the end of the month. And so I won't have that information, I hope, before the 24th, but I won't have it as early as I hoped that I would have it. And we are also waiting for the CPIU, which I think it, I was told is the 18th we're supposed to get that information to know what the cap will be. Uh, on February 28th, uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m., we'll have our first uh, official budget workshop where the uh, cost center managers will present their budget to the board. Uh, I will remind people that we are, have built into each of these a public comment session at the beginning of each of these meetings uh, to mirror what the uh, town council is also going to be doing. March 4th is a Saturday, and we will be meeting from 8.30 to 2.15 uh, for public comment and budget workshop in the council chambers, again, for the cost center managers to present their budgets at that point in time. Uh, March 7th will be a public forum and budget workshop, and that will be your opportunity to uh, spend as, uh, a lot of time looking at the budget and really beginning to take a look at where it will start the transition from being the superintendent's budget to the school board budget. Uh, March 14th, uh, hopefully at that school board meeting, which is at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, you will approve your budget and it then becomes the school board's budget for the year 2006-2007. Uh, March 31st, we have built in a uh, time to deliver that budget to the town council. April 13th, the Town Council Finance Committee will review the school budget in Council Chambers. On April 26th, there will be a public hearing on the proposed budget, which is a Wednesday at 7.30. And on May 15th, hopefully, and uh, it's a Monday at 7.30, the budget will be adopted. Again, these schedules uh, have been sent to the newspapers, and we are trying to make sure they're posted so that people will see them and know uh, when those hearings are as we move along. Any questions on that? Okay, the next step is to take a look at the uh, capital improvement plan and the renovation funds. Uh, we've had some discussion about this. I'm going to pass to you a updated uh, document as of today, uh, and we'll explain it briefly. I also have asked Ernie to be here to be able to answer any questions that you may have around CIP. <sighs> Just so that, that we're all on the same page here, the CIP is a capital improvement plan. And what it is is really taking a look at five years down the road and what we feel needs to happen over that five-year period to ensure that our uh, infrastructure is kept in good condition. Uh, the way I understand the CIP here in uh, Cape Elizabeth is the CIP uh, is written, but it goes into the regular budget, just so, you are, so that everybody is aware of that. What you have in front of you is a series of items uh, which have been proposed by Ernie for the CIP. These items in particular are items that we're looking at because of the high school renovation project. And so most of my high school, except for the last one, 
These are all possible renovation pieces that, because when you got the vote for the high school renovation, it only renovated parts of the high school. There are parts of the high, high school that have got very little work done on them. But the one thing that needs to happen is now the old mechanical infrastructure needs to be connected to the new mechanical infrastructure so that they work together. So what I've asked Ernie to do and what he'll speak to in just a minute is he has given us a list of those items which are we're looking at that could easily be a part of the renovation project. Now, to be very clear is we do not know what the bottom line is yet. We don't know how much money is going to be left. This may be way more than what we've got. It may be way less. I am hoping before the uh, building committee meets that we will have some be much more specific. Uh, Pauline was working on it today, looking at bills that have not been paid, and also there are certain items that we still don't have pricing on. And so once those are resolved, which hopefully will be in the next couple of weeks, then we'll have some idea what our bottom line is. Uh, so what I would ask, uh, with your permission, is to have uh, Ernie have a chance to speak to some of these. If you notice down the side, there are priorities that Ernie has put on these as far as importance goes. Uh, I would ask if uh, Ernie could come to the microphone and speak to any of these and also answer any questions that you might have about this uh, as we move ahead on this. Ernie, thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ernie, facilities manager, and uh, hopefully I can answer any questions you have. But first of all, do you have? I'm not sure that I'm not sure what you have for a packet. But do you have the a breakdown page on the back that? Um, we have a draft of the capital improvement. It's a mechanical upgrade summary sheet that I put together for. I'm not. This is what we, they have got right here. Plus they've got this. Okay, then, then you don't have it. Okay. Okay. Um, that's not a problem. I just um, thought it might have been a little bit easier. But okay. Um, on the uh, first page, which I've asked for, and I prioritize this down through um, 1 through 12, and then you have the Pond Cove Elementary School. Um, on the bottom. As, as the high school, you'll see one, two, and three is the replacement of um, electronic actuators for the unit ventilator. Now, a unit ventilators are the heating units in each classroom. And what they do is they bring in fresh air and then they mix the fresh air with heated air to, to, uh, to heat the room. Um, and right now they're, they're air driven. And these are, this is original equipment that was installed in 69 and it's fatigued. Now as part of the project, there was either six or eight thousand dollars that was set aside for all these units to be ripped down, cleaned, and put back together. That money was, uh, that part of the job was uh, delayed or, or, or taken out of the project. There were a number of these things that were taken out of the project because Initially, there was a feeling we may not be able to meet the target of uh, whatever the bond was. So we eliminated those things and we put them on uh, to-do list, or uh, the terminology is a little off here, but uh, to-do later if, if money was available. Yeah. Um, we're looking at the, the upgrade of 38 units. The actual bid documents that you look at show for 21 units. The 21 units would have cost us, had we gone with it originally, uh, $1,500 per unit. Now the uh, subcontractor made a mistake and went and audited all this equipment. And because of the type of units that we have, we are really the only market in the area for this particular actuator and stuff. Um, so I was able to work out a deal outside the project, uh, which is perfectly legitimate, it, it, to the point where we can, get, we can get this work done for $650 a unit. And that's a substantial savings. Um, I th 
So obviously I, I want to jump all over that if, if, if the money's available and if, if you feel that that's the route to go. Uh, one of the really nice things that I can tell you tonight is over the last several years, our target has been to renovate all the classrooms. And through this project, as we've added in with monies available that we've taken out and set aside for maintenance to use to do things like carpentry, ceilings, instead of bidding those out, we kept it in-house. By, by doing that, we were able to do seven, six or seven more classrooms. That's, that's new lighting, new ceilings, painting, uh, the works. And we are down to the last handful of classrooms. Five or six. Five if you use just one hand, six if you use it. Uh, five classrooms in the health, the health department, uh, and we're done. This means that we will have completed uh, all new lighting throughout our entire facility, um, ceilings throughout the entire facility, um, painting pretty much, all the classrooms have been painted. So it, this, this CIP budget along with the packet that you have uh, will finish all the classrooms. So we've we finally reached that goal that we're looking for. Also, by by replacing these um, 38 univentilator actuators, the system will be more efficient. They'll close completely instead of partly. Um, and we have a gentleman in the school that's teaching the students this year on energy management, Mr. Lisa, and. There's some very interesting information that he's forwarded to maintenance that it appears, and we're still working on this, that these, these unit ventilators are bringing in a lot more fresh air than we really need. And that in itself is a, an energy waste. So not only will it help address those issues by regulating the proper amount of, of uh, makeup air, uh, by doing that, then you won't, by bringing in too much air, you have to add more heat. It's, it's costly. And we'll get, to, it, 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 we'll get it right down to where it needs to be, and it will, there'll be a payoff there. And I think that just when you look at our, our use over the last five years, that we've been pretty, pretty even across the board. This year, I, I, we're already better this year in terms of gallon that's used. Of course, the weather's been a little bit better too, but even so, um, we are saving energy. And even though the cost is going up in some areas, we are saving energy. So my proposal is that if money is available and that you feel that this is the, the, the best uh, use of the, the funds, then I would, I would like to see money put aside for the actuators. Um, the ATM room, a ATM room is the, the old lecture hall. Um, we're looking at replacing both of the units in that, um, that area. The project, that was taken out of the project as well, and that was a uh, 14,000 something ticket item that was taken out. Um, so we're, we're looking at addressing that. Those so, units are- Ernie, are, could I just ask, because I think this is important for the board to know, that as you're going through these items, these items were in the original plan yes. that we saw from the architect that the voters saw um, when they voted on these bonds. Correct. Correct. And it was, they were only removed from the project when we wanted to be sure that we were able to do the other items in a priority order of list. That's correct. And they were added to an ad alternate, which puts them aside for a decision later right. on as money comes available. So I just, I just want it to be clear that it was a part of the original package. Yeah. And, I, and I will point out those that are not. Okay, okay. The, 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 uh, I don't believe the rebuilding number five, the rebuilding of HVAC number four at $8,700 was part of our project, okay? But this, was, this but is, this a, is, this is a, a, a large air handler which serves the library area. And over the last three years, we've 
we've patched the heating coil several times because it's fatigued. It's, you know, we've had several leaks. So, but that was not part of the project. And, um, and you know, I elected to put it in because it's something that we need to address. Um, as we go down, um, the marker and tack boards, that was taken out of the project as well. And I don't remember what the base, baseline of that was, 15,000, I think, seems to ring a bell. Yeah. Um, and compared to what we've had over the years, over the years we've, we've been purchasing just a whiteboard that we, we would build a wooden frame over and you wash it two or three times and you, you can't, yeah, it turns gray and, you, you know, we started putting some of these, we we're putting as part of the project. They're really nice boards and the teachers really enjoy them and, and you can see what they put on them. So, um, and, and this included, the cost on those, if I recall, Ernie, I'd like to just share this, is that you are installing them in-house. We are, yeah, that's, we took it out of the project because uh, the labor to install them, um, I think, equaled the... Uh, the cost of the board Yeah, I think itself. it was a $30,000 package, and we cut it to fifteen, knowing that maintenance would install okay. so the, the boards, right. Savings there. Um, the washer and dryer for the uh, laundry room. About three years ago, we put a new washer and dryer unit in, and the remaining two units have since been thrown away. They're, they're, they've, they've met their end. <laughs> so we're down to just a washer and dryer. Uh, this was not part of the project, so this is, this is outside the project. I've requested it because uh, we need it. Um, conduit to the uh, new soccer field is, is, uh, not part, was not part of the project, although lighting upgrades is part of the project. So I guess, you know, it depends on how you look at it. Did we plan on putting new, a new trench down into the new field and bring power to it? No. But during the process of reviewing and, and working around what we had, uh, we, we know two things. One is that the lines that, were, that went down there weren't grounded properly. And uh, a couple of years ago, I had a transformer put in so it could be grounded properly. Well, since then, we've lost one of the legs that go down there that supply power to the lights. So we're going to have to excavate when we do bring new power down. We're also looking into an alternative of bringing power in maybe from the Cape, Cape Woods area overhead, set a couple poles. We don't know just which way we're going to go yet. I put this in there knowing that um, we need to be prepared to do one or the other when it comes time to use our field. And so, yes, it, we were going to do lighting in, as part of the project to upgrade and add some new poles and what have you. Um, so in that sense, that's part of the bond. But this is directed in a different, different way than what was proposed originally, and that's because of things that we determined and that's basically what like a contingency fund from the project is set up to handle some unexpected things such as right. this, which is to complete the original aspect of the project. Correct. So. Correct. But I just, I just wanted to make sure that you understood that it was not underground line to the field was not part of the original proposal, but mm -hmm. it's going to have to happen that way. Um, Security system, not part of the project. Um, since we've put the security system in at the high school, um, we have had minimal damages, minimal. Um, outside cameras have, we don't, I mean, we've had, we had some, some well, several thousand dollars worth of damage on Windows here a couple years back. And uh, when we put the cameras in, basically most, of, if not, I won't say all, but most of the vandalism has stopped at the high school. We do have some cameras in the middle school. Um, it's made a difference. Um, and these cameras that are being proposed here would uh, be the type of camera that could be operated from a remote distance from the police department, actually. My goal is to connect them to the police department so that they can watch the front of the school and um, the back of the school.
from a remote location. Um, Bernie, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Um, the back parking lot of the high school. Yes. How well is that covered now? It's not covered. Just checking because that's where my car was broken into. So. Oh. Um, and it wasn't covered well that particular night <coughs> for whatever reason. No, the, the, um, we do have an outside camera, and, but it, it just it wasn't in that location. It isn't in that location. Yeah. But uh, it works well. <laughs> where it is. <laughs> um, so that really sums, sums up what I'm, what I'm asking for here in terms of if there is money available. That, um, and, this, and I prioritized it as, as far as what I think is. You want to, the hot water heater replacement you want to talk about? The hot water heater placement, uh, middle school. The, the, the heater that, that we have at the middle school is a 400 gallon uh, oil fired hot water heater and last year and last couple of years we have been finding that internal pots are wearing and breaking down we're finding it difficult to get new replacement pots the uh, the uh, photo cell which determines whether it lights properly or not uh, if we can't get the pots that's gonna we have to upgrade so on and so forth so the, the bid that I got originally to do that was uh, $40,000. And looking into it um, myself and, and going to the people that, that I purchased from our vendors, um, we can purchase the tank directly and then I, I've put in some money to install it. But rather than remove the existing tank, which was proposed, uh, we'd set this up so that it would run uh, with the existing tank. And what we'll do is have a lead lag system so that um, it'll run one week, and then this, the next week the other, the other tank will run. By doing that, we'll hopefully get a lot more use out of the existing system, and at the same time have some redundancy there so that if something does fail, we can go to one or the other. Um, I, I just want to say that as part of a conversation that I was sharing with you and Alan one afternoon was that uh, this is the type of water heater unit that if it, the existing one fails, it's not like you or I who would just call and the supplier would bring one out the next day. It's something that would have a, a like a six week, I believe, lead time. Yes. If at the very least. And so what you've done is you've left your school without hot water. Um, for that time period, so it's kind of a standard way of doing things. This lag. Yeah, the the, the like for the, the high school has a. Well, I think it's a 2,000 gallon storage tank, but it's heated off two different boilers. So if you had, if you had a problem with one boiler, it would go to the other boiler. If you, tanks, unlike uh, water heaters, are are more available in terms of being able to have access to them because basically they're. They're, uh, it's just a, a heat exchange, you know, and it's, it's easier to, uh, to uh, get that type of equipment. But when you start talking, these water heaters, they're made uh, basically per order. They're not something you see in inventory. They're too big. Um, On the hot water heater. Excuse me? That was not part of any project that was done at the Pond Cove or Middle School and taken out, was it? No, but the, okay. the Pond Cove project um, has had some impact on the use of the existing uh, equipment. Um, not a lot, but, you know, when you add uh, the wing that we added and you, and you look at the hot water used to wash the floors and the students and the, the, I think, I'm not sure how many kindergarten students we introduced to the school. 115, 20, some. Uh, 115. Yeah, okay. Um, that in itself will have some impact on the use of hot water. So, um, no, it wasn't part of the project, but the project does have an effect on it, or an impact, I should say. Thank you. Yeah. Elaine, can you clarify? I'm getting the sense that this is something, I'm not sure which comes first, that this is going to require a recommendation by the building committee. 
Yes, the building committee is meeting uh, next Thursday evening. Um, we will be seeing this information um, along with any remaining monies from the project, and they will then be making a recommendation to the town council for, um, I guess you call it, disbursement of those funds. Um, I'm looking or hoping that later on under new business that the school board would make a recommendation to the building committee um, to support uh, Ernie's CIP monies. And that's where I was headed. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me, Elaine. Yeah. I might have it wrong, but I've written down that it's next Wednesday evening. Is it next Wednesday? I'm at 6 sorry. 30 in the high school cafeteria. Uh, Does that sound right? I, I don't mean to. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll double check. I, okay. I, I'm going off my memory. It, That's okay. It's one of these days. One of those, one days, of those next days, next days next week. Okay, thanks. I put the email out, and uh, it's not listed on our list of meetings. No. Okay. Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? Okay, thank you. Um, Mary. Which is the 18th. The 18th, and, and no ma whatever the board decides to vote, uh, I would um, also encourage school board members to come to that meeting. Um, it's, it's very pertinent to our, our budget um, and also to the completion of the project, so um, I, I will add that. What time is that meeting, Elaine? We start at 7. I wrote down 6.30. Oh, yes, you're right. We are starting at 6.30, and there's going to be a tour of the, uh, uh, the high school. And uh, then we will move into the newly renovated library uh, to conduct the meeting. And we are meeting in the cafeteria at 6.30. So again, it's another great opportunity to uh, see the, the, the auditorium. I don't think many of us have seen that since our last tour and some of the work that's been done in the IT wing. So thank you, Kathy, for reminding me. Sorry to be disagreeable. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you have anything else for Ernie? Is there anything else you need to share? Um, no, I, that would be it. Uh, well, I, will, I will say that now that I have the opportunity that I want to thank the, um, my crew for doing a, a, a for putting up with me for the last couple of years. It's been, it's been difficult with this project. There's been so much for them to do and for the administration and their help and your help and it's all worked out well and the students are the, uh, the beneficiaries of all this work, so that's good. And I just want you to know that I have learned that Ernie is the number one wheeler dealer in this system. <laughs> so. Some amazing things. He'll come into my office and say, I think I can do this, and he does. So yeah. it's, uh, he is the wheel. Scary, leader. huh? Yeah, it is. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Kathy. I just wanted to uh, thank Ernie. As a member of the building committee, I've had a chance to see um, the things that he's done, and the wheeling dealing is part of it. But, you know, he'll come in and he'll say, they want 7000 I can do it for 1000 They want 10000 I can do it for two. And we're like, whoa. And he saved us thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on this project. Right. He's just done a fantastic job. I personally like the thing where he was taking ballasts out of existing lights and putting them in, in a box so he could use them later. <laughs> well, it's $16 just, dollars a piece if you buy them. You can't throw them. Right. But most people just throw away things, and, and he does, and he's very frugal. So thank well, you, Ernie. Well, thank you. All set? All set. Great. Thank you, Ernie. What? What I am hoping that uh, the board will do this evening is, is uh, one of the things that Ernie has done is prioritize these. Again, as you see, the total price is $106,434. Uh, we're not sure that we're going to have that much money in the remainder of the account. Hopefully, by the time you meet next week, we will have a much clearer idea. But we'll, what I'm hoping you will direct the uh, building committee to do is to support these in the order of priority. And so if we can cover eight of them, and we'll cover eight of them. If we can cover 12 of them, we'll do that. Uh, but I'm hoping that's how you will take a look at that at that point in time. Can I ask you a quick question then? How would that impact this listing in terms yes. of priority if we make that recommendation then do we tie our hands? Or in the whole scheme of things, are some of the things on here more important if it's all coming out of the school budget as opposed to the project budget? 
what we what we've looked at, and Pauline has we just uh, reviews this again before she left this afternoon, and these priority items that you have on this list of this list here are certainly the priority items of the entire CIP budget. The other things that are on here, there have been several changes, and uh, this will be upgraded again for you. For instance, uh, we have heard, and we're just waiting for final confirmation, that it looks like that the state will be paying for the replacement um, laptops for grade seven and eight, which we have built in here. And so that, if that does happen, that will be dropped from here. There are several other items uh, that uh, uh, have Ernie has talked with uh, Pauline about and therefore have been redistributed on here. So this, as you see, is a draft for 12-2905. There will be an updated draft prior to uh, the meeting of the building committee next week and probably even another one prior to the meeting with you on January 24th as we continue to look at them. So from a priority standpoint, cumulatively, these are number 13. Right. That's exactly right. Thank you. Are we ready to move on to committee reports? Uh, Finance Committee, uh, Rebecca. The Finance Committee met on Wednesday, December 28th. Um, myself, Kathy, Linda, Elaine, Alan, and Pauline attended. We signed warrants. We reviewed the monthly energy report and received um, an explanation of um, what Pauline had forecasted as reimbursements for various um, types of fuel for oil and electricity, because um, it shows up as a very positive balance right now since we've incurred not as much as she was projecting as reimbursed. Those items are coming from the pool share of the cost for oil and electricity, and the gas there's a gasoline reimbursement from the athletic budget for athletic transportation. We had a question uh, as to whether or not we were going to be impacted by the projected increase in the electricity rate. And Pauline explained that we will not be impacted by that for our current contract. Um, it was negotiated back in September through a consortium. Uh, I believe it was called the Power Option Consortium and we're protected um, at that rate through February of uh, 2007. Alan reported that Ernie is still working on balancing the high school as a way to improve energy efficiency. We reviewed the monthly food service report. The negative student accounts remained fairly stable uh, from October's amount, roughly at about 6800 up about $100 from the previous month. The Finance Committee confirmed that it believes it falls within the superintendent's management responsibility to review special circumstances that may arise that would or would not result in a forgiveness of a student's school lunch debt. Uh, we also discussed any possible other ideas uh, to limit the number, the amount of negative student accounts, and I believe Linda raised the question of whether late fees may be an appropriate thing to institute. Um, we did not make a decision on that, but it was raised as a discussion uh, topic for our next meeting. We reviewed the draft budget schedule, which Alan has now gone, uh, got, went over earlier. Um, and then we spent a significant amount of time discussing what materials should be presented um, at the Town Council School Board workshop. And uh, that's it for the Finance Committee meeting. We, our next one will be on January 24th at 1230 in the superintendent's office. Um, I'd also just like to go over briefly for um, public awareness of the materials that we did present at the Town Council School Board workshop. Um, and I've got the wrong paper. And, no, I have the right paper. Sorry. To preface, all this information is preliminary. We are at the very beginning stages of the budget process, and these numbers will change as we go through our various workshops and meetings. As of the uh, workshop last week with the town council, um, Alan and Pauline projected a 2.84% increase over last year's budget that would incorporate 
heating oil, electricity, gasoline, a bus purchase three-year lease agreement, three out-of-district um, special education placements, the increase in the Portland Arts and Technical High School tuition, and the capital improvement plan, which we obviously have seen that could, could and hopefully will change depending on uh, what we discussed early, later tonight. Then on top of that, um, a scenario analysis was performed <laughs> on what would be the net impact for salaries if they went up by various um, percentages. Obviously, we can't um, really uh, discuss what it will or will not be as we are in negotiations with a number of parties. Uh, but with uh, uh, just a 1% district-wide wage increase, that would bring the total budget increase up to 5.92% over last year's budget. And it goes up even more with a 2% wage increase at 6.36, and with a 3% wage increase at 6.8%. So, and I believe that Mike McGovern um, estimated at the meeting that he thinks the CPI for December will be roughly 3.5%, but we will find out in a couple, in about a week. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, the next uh, committee report would be uh, planning committee, Trish. Um, the planning committee is meeting this Friday, um, January 13th, with Alan to review the results of his discussions with some of the action teams from the original five-year plan. And we will also um, talk about how we're going to proceed, sort of update the plan, now that we're you know, really refocusing on it. Good. Great. Thank you. Um, the policy committee, Anne. Policy committee did not meet in December in lieu of that meeting. Alan and the three principals and I did meet with Dan Rose of Drummond Woodsum to discuss um, a couple of policies in detail, mainly our religion in the schools policy that we're still continuing to work on. The next meeting will be next Tuesday um, from 12 to 2 here in the Jordan Conference Room. Thank you. Uh, personnel committee, Kathy. Thanks. Um, the Personnel Committee met December 19th. Um, our primary focus was um, continuing to put together job descriptions, and we met with um, several of the district leadership team folks to get their input on um, job descriptions that they had been working on, um, and um, they'll be coming back with some additional information, um, and we also discussed um, performance appraisal types of forms and having some consistency there. And uh, the next meeting is January 26th at 1 o'clock. Great. Um, the Substance Abuse Policy Review Subcommittee. Um, the committee met on December 14th and we discussed at length um, the student contracts. Are those contracts for the, which are signed by a student who participates currently on an athletic team? Um, we talked a lot about seasonal versus year-long contracts, and the majority of the committee supported year-long contracts. So this will be incorporated into the recommendation to the policy committee. We also began talking about the consequences which would result from contract violations in different scenarios. Our next meeting is tomorrow, January 11th at 8 a.m., and we will be discussing the uh, jurisdiction aspects of the policy implementation. Thank you. Um, Communications Committee, Rebecca. Yes, we um, have not met for several months, but we are meeting this week. Um, that would be tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock, where we will review um, our efforts to get information out to the public about the great things that's going on. And uh, I, Trish and I did meet uh, with Alan in December to consult on the publication of the view to kind of brainstorm ideas um, and I believe that that's actually moving forward I don't know if we actually have a publication date a publication date is it will be out by February 10th February 10th yep. great, great. great. Um, and finally uh, Kevin with the student extracurricular committee Yes, the, uh, we met on December 20th, uh, Alan Hawkins, Scott Labby, Elaine Maloney, Jeff Shedd, myself, Keith Weatherby, Sue Weatherby, and Linda Winker. 
Those are the current members of the committee, and I, I go back over that because this is a brand new committee just formed by the board in December. Um, we began meeting at uh, 2 o'clock and took care of a couple of housekeeping issues, um, discussed the recommendation, some recommendations to the board relative to our charge and goals, and um, as a charge, the committee um, is submitting to the full board later. The Extracurricular Activities Committee shall oversee all aspects of the extracurricular programs and activities offered to students in the Cape Elizabeth uh, schools. It should be noted that extracurricular, that term now includes athletics in the school. Um, for goals, um, in order of, uh, in, in the order in which they were decided upon, uh, was one, to define the structure, process, and procedures of the committee, two, to conduct an annual review of all extracurricular activities, three, to review and work on implementation of sports done right, and finally, to review and comment on all school, school board policies that relate to extracurricular activities. Um, this new committee takes over most of the functions of the former co-curricular committee. And there is an issue there. The co-curricular committee is defined in the teacher contract and was responsible for making recommendations on all stipend positions, regardless of whether they were student activity or administrative stipend. Uh, we will be recommending um, that the Extracurricular extra Activities Committee be responsible for hearing and making uh, student activity stipend issue decisions, and the Personnel Committee be responsible for hearing and making recommendations on administrative stipend issues. Uh, this will, of course, require uh, some language changes um, if it's to be implemented. And uh, for this year, we will, um, of course, abide by the existing contract in the event the co-curricular committee meeting is needed. We have some action plans. Uh, he Keith will hold a meeting of the Athletic Steering Committee and did hold the meeting of the Athletic Steering Committee. Um, Jeff, and with me as necessary, and I guess I wasn't necessary, We'll try to adapt the athletic steering committee process to the student co-curricular process, and we'll be making a recommendation or report on progress uh, at the next meeting, which is January 19th. Alan is gathering all the existing policies and guidelines that relate to athletic or student co-curricular activities. It will also have binders made up to contain this in the documents generated by the committee. And then finally, Alan will be speaking with Shari Robinson for history on section 7, 8, and 9 of the teacher contract. And we will be working on recommendations on language change that might be needed. Um, that's pretty much it. The meeting ended at 3.15. Where our uh, next meeting is January 19th, which is a Thursday at 2 p.m. in the Jordan's conference room. Thank you. That's it. Great. Uh, Rebecca, is there anything legislatively that you would like to share with us? Well, I, I believe all of you received the same information I did from the MSMA, I believe. Um, I would encourage you to look at that and determine if you think that there is anything on there that I should give any special consideration to you know, follow up information um, and just email me and let me know. Um, I can <coughs> And um, I obviously will keep an eye on it and will raise a red flag if I see something that may um, be of concern that we as a board would want to take action on. Great, thank you. Um, I'd just like to report that the education found, Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation uh, did not meet in, dis well, they did meet in December, but not since our last meeting. Um, they did have a very successful luminaries uh, for education event during the solstice. Uh, they continue to work on policy. 
their endowment continues to grow. And I think that their next meeting will be on January 23rd, will they, where they will be voting on a slate of uh, new directors. And they will be replacing um, outgoing directors who are on a three-year cycle with uh, nine new members. And the following year, they'll be replacing 11 new members. But at any one time, they will always have 12, 20 members, at least 20 members, including educational advisors, of which we have quite a few between teachers and administrators. So um, they will be going out to the public with uh, some more fundraising towards the endowment after the first of the year. So uh, Kevin, you to speak towards PASS. I'd rather not, because it doesn't help students in any way. but. <clears throat> the Constitution and bylaws of PASS require some, uh, the sending schools to make some very early decisions on the Part 2 portion of the budget. And some of the larger schools uh, who have significant investments in PASS have felt that this was a dangerous thing to do um, in tough budget times, was to make those decisions before they had actually considered their own um, uh, district budgets. And what was proposed was a change in dates. I've distributed, and I think you might have had in your packets as well, copies of the changes. They, uh, there's nothing in here other than date changes. It has no negative impact whatsoever on uh, the Cape Elizabeth School District or any of the sending school districts for that matter. And today, we did uh, recommend a change of one section that dealt with information going back to 1998 that um, no longer made any sense to include in the Constitution. I will be recommending to you later uh, to authorize uh, Alan and or I to vote in favor of this at the next past meeting. Uh, thank you. And unless there's any questions on this. No. Okay. Um, the town comprehensive plan committee did not meet in the month of December. And as you know, they, we had the forum, and I think we've all been updated on that. They will be meeting um, on the 26th of January at 7.30 in the Jordan Conference Room for the next meeting. Unfinished business uh, policies for a second reading. Ann. Okay, there are 10 policies in your packet, and with the exception of the first one, they're all the technology policies. Um, these are presented to you here exactly as they were for first reading. No changes were made, and I haven't received any uh, comments. Not that there may not be any further ones tonight, but. Um, so in the interest of time, what I was thinking about doing was just um, voting on them as a whole packet. So um, I'd like to move that we accept the policies in your packet. Do you think I need to read all of these? Yeah. The policies in your packet um, as presented. A second. Great. Is there any discussion and questions? Any further um, comments regarding the policies? Great. Uh, all those in favor? Thank you very much. 7 0. Uh, new business consideration of the superintendent's recommendations for athletic fee positions. I have two recommendations this evening, both from the middle school from Scott Labby. The first one is Megan Greenlaw as seventh grade bas uh, girls basketball coach. It's 153.6 hours at a level two. Megan played basketball at South Bowen High School under the guidance of Coach Ron Kierstead. She is eager to start a coaching career, and her enthusiasm will be a great asset to our program. And I would also mention that she did also play at Memorial Middle School when I was there. <laughs> uh, so she is, she is nominated for the seventh grade girls basketball. And Laurie Broadhurst is the eighth grade girls basketball coach, uh, nominated for the girls basketball coach. 153.6 hours at a level three. Laurie brings experience as both a player and a coach with her to this position. This will benefit the middle school girls greatly. She is also a val valuable member of our high school coaching staff. Um, do I have a motion to accept those recommendations? 
Thank you, Kevin. Uh, second. Oh, yes, thank you. For further discussion? Oh, all those in favor? 7 0. Uh, I also have a co curricular one. Uh, is, as you see in the letter in front of you, uh, in a review of the co curricular positions with the payroll office, we found that a number of positions have been inadvertently left off the list and contracts have not been issued. Below, for your consideration at the J January 10th meeting, is a list of those positions. First of all, high school department heads is for guidance, Sharon Merrill. For health, physical education, Scott Shea. And senior transition project is Mark Pendarvis. High school student activities, Amnesty International is Rachel Guthrie. Chorus is Kristen Thomas. Jazz Band 3 is Todd Roberts. And robotics team is Evan Thayer. I have a motion. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, second. Rebecca, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Questions? <coughs> All those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Uh, consideration of proposed changes to the PATH's constitution and bylaws. I'd like to move that the board authorize the superintendent and or the representative to the General Advisory Committee of PATH to vote in favor of the proposed changes to the past constitution and bylaws as discussed um, in committee reports. Do I have a second? Thank you, Trish. Any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Seven, zero. Consideration of the CIP plan. Kevin. I, I move that the school board endorse the CIP plan presented tonight and make a recommendation to the building committee to, um, to vote accordingly in their own deliberations. Is there a second? Trish? Any comments or questions yeah, for that I have motion? A question. Um, you're talking about the presentation that Ernie did, the one-page sheet, correct, and, and just the one-page sheet. Um, should we not be um, having maybe a side piece of that that talks about the um, amount of leftover funds versus the amount that's requested? Because I'm not comfortable with recommending that we authorize the 106 dollars if in fact there's not sufficient funds left over from the project um, so I'm not sure if maybe we should incorporate that into the motion or, or you know we, we could do that with uh, an, with in order of priority as uh, Ernie had recommended so we amendment. can do that but I think that we are simply recommending um, that these be uh, considered by the building committee and approved by the building committee and it's up the, to the building committee um, to decide and uh, how much money is available and how it's uh, going to be spent. So if there's not enough funds, clearly they cannot. Uh, well, you know, it's no big deal. I'll take an amendment to the motion. I'm, d I'm just, I'm sort of asking the question out no, loud no. because it's, I... It, I, I don't want somebody to say, well, the school board has authorized us to spend 106 and we don't have 106. Well, we, we can't, we're not authorizing them. We're, we're making a recommendation right. to them. We can't authorize them to spend that money. Right. I just they're, they're the ones who have to then make the recommendation to the council to spend the money. But yeah, I have no problem in taking an amendment that says, in effect, that um, in the order of priority, as enumerated in with, with leftover funds from the project or something, um, as funds are available, as funds are available from the project. No. I think mm -hmm. that is right, is to do it just that way, priorities at, with the funds that are available. I'd, I'd feel more comfortable with that myself. Okay, so you've made an amendment. I, I move that the original motion be, be amended <laughs> to state that our recommendation includes um, the buildings committee taking it in order of priority dependent upon the amount of funds actually available. That sounds good. 
<laughs> Thank you, Kevin. You got that, Mary? Does anyone need that repeated, or is it clear? Oh, no. Okay. I couldn't repeat it. All right. Well, um, I'll, um, do, do we have a second? Thank you, Linda. Um, any other comments? Being none, uh, all those in favor? 7 0. Thank you for wording that and going through that. <laughs> <laughs> um, at this point, I'll look to see if there's any public comment. Seeing none. Um, Elaine, yes. sorry. Oh, yeah, we do have a consideration. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can't um, forget that. We'll um, go back to the consideration uh, of your um, goals. I'm sorry. Do I? Um, I, I, I move that the school board uh, adopt the charge and goals of the extracurricular activities committee as explained in that committee report. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Kathy. Any questions, comments? Being none, all those in favor? Seven. Zero. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Still looks like there's no one out here for public comments. So we'll go to, uh, are there any school board agenda requests for our next meeting from fellow school board members? At this point, uh, we are set and announcements of upcoming meetings. Um, correct me if I get some of these wrong, but I think I've got them. Uh, personnel committee, Thursday, January 26, 1 p.m., superintendent's office. Substance Abuse Committee is tomorrow morning, Wednesday, January 11th, 8 a.m., William Conference, Jordan Conference Room. Communication Committee, Wednesday, January 11th, 3 p.m., in the Pond Cove Conference Room. Policy Committee will meet on Tuesday, January 17th, at noontime in the Jordan Conference Room. Our Extracurricular Committee will be meeting Thursday, January 19th, 2 p.m., in the Conference Room. Finance Committee will be meeting Tuesday, January 24th, 12.30 p.m. in the Superintendent's Office. Uh, the Building Committee, I will add in, is on next Wednesday at 6.30 uh, for the tour starts in the cafeteria and the meeting starts at 7 in the high school uh, library. Our next school board workshop will be Tuesday, January 24th, 7 p.m. in the high school library. We will be discussing the start of the 2006-2007 budget. And our next school board business meeting will be Tuesday, February 14th, 7 p.m. right here in council chambers. Um, I guess we can now adjourn. Do I have a motion? I move that we adjourn. Thank you very much. A second? Thanks. Um, all those in favor? 7-0. Thank you.